welcome all to this uh, uh, online conference on freedom of expression and democracy in Europe. Uh, the conference is organized uh, at the University of Lyon uh, by Pierre Auriel and uh, Marcel Charles Girard as part of a collective research program uh, entitled EGALIBEX for Freedom of Expression and Equal Participation, uh, which is funded by the French National Research Agency. And it has also benefited from the, the support of the Thomas Research Program on Freedom of Expression, Genealogies, Models and Institutions. Um, so we've been working for over a year and a half now uh, on a collective book project, as many of you know, uh, which uh, we will edit with Andrew Kenyon, on the relationship between free expression on the one hand and democracy on the other, uh, with a wonderful group of uh, legal scholars, philosophers, and judges from various European countries, who are all uh, renowned specialists of free expression in the European context. Uh, many of the participants have been able to present uh, a draft, a first draft of their chapter, or at least some preliminary thoughts about it, uh, in the online seminar series we've organized uh, throughout 2021. Some of those meetings have been recorded and you can find uh, the videos on, on the program's website. But this final conference uh, is the occasion to, to present all the papers together, uh, to have extensive discussions among ourselves, and also to benefit from uh, the comments of uh, world leading experts on free speech who are coming from non European backgrounds, in particular from the United States, uh, from Australia, and from Israel. Uh, we were hoping, of course, to have this conference in Lyon, uh, in person, as we now say, uh, but the pandemic and the general context made it too difficult for, for many of you. So the conference is entirely online, uh, which explains why we have tried it and uh, shortened it on uh, one day and a half. But we do hope, however, to have um, some opportunity in the near future to, to welcome you in Lyon. In any case, we are very grateful for you to, to be here, despite all the scheduling complications which are associated with the conference uh, uh, spread over three continents and uh, 16 time zones. Uh, so thank you very much. And by way of introduction to the conference, I'm going to briefly present uh, the book's ambition uh, and the way it has been structured, uh, as well as the conference lineup. And, and Pierre Auriel will then take over and uh, he's going to introduce and chair our first panel. So, uh, an overview of the book's project. Uh, we all know that massive changes in communication practices and in communication technologies have happened over the last 20 years or 30 years. And they have also led to major, sh to major shifts in the regulation of public debate and the regulation of free speech in liberal democracies. So the growth and the diversification of uh, exchanges between citizens, uh, the fragmentation also of the media space into a far greater plurality of forums, uh, the emergence of powerful private actors uh, who control many of these new forums. All these changes uh, suggest that the evolution of public communication and the new forms of regulation it engenders can either sustain or threaten uh, the democratic public sphere. It's clear if we think, for instance, about uh, the regulation of hate speech, the regulation of fake news, uh, the increasing use of artificial intelligence in the regulation of online content, especially, uh, or the regulatory power which has been accumulated by online platforms, uh, or the development of um, pervasive surveillance of citizens by both states and by private actors. So all these developments uh, call for a critical re-evaluation of our understanding of free expression and of its relation to democracy. This relation is uh, sometimes understood as being merely external. So free expression as some form of private liberty uh, would simply need to be protected and limited, uh, its potential excess controlled, in a way that protects other rights and uh, uh, independent general aims. For instance, democratic debate, which is then understood as being independent from freedom of expression. But uh, our starting point is the idea that a more reflexive understanding of this right also suggests something like an internal or intrinsic connection 
between the two, between freedom of expression uh, and democracy, which means uh, that freedom of expression is also, and maybe first and for, uh, uh, above all else, a political right, a fundamental political right uh, to participate in public communication, a right to express one's opinion on public affairs and on social issues publicly, a right to hear, to hear others' opinions, and a right to inform oneself regarding those uh, issues and affairs. So if we take this seriously, this right needs to be defined and its exercise needs to be um, organized in a way that is conducive to democratic debate. Uh, in its classic Handicide and oft quoted Handicide decisions of 1976, the European Court of Human Rights uh, affirmed that free expression constitutes one of the essential foundations of a democratic society. So it very explicitly endorsed this long-standing view that freedom of expression is not merely a private freedom of the individual or a, a legal instrument enabling governments to pursue various social ends, but a fundamental political freedom because it is a necessary condition for democratic politics. So this is the general uh, explicit idea, but what it doesn't make clear is what are the legal uh, implications and what is the legal meaning of such a view, of such a statement? or what should be its legal meaning and implications. And this is the main questions we do want to address in the book in the European context. And the assumption is that we do need to understand this connection, its meaning and implications, to give a principled basis for the new regulatory frameworks, both at the European level and at the level of each European nation state. So, of course, this link between uh, free speech and self-government has been very often emphasized in the U.S. context, in the U.S. constitutional tradition, uh, both by judges and by uh, legal doctrine and commentators. It is very frequently invoked um, to justify the extensive protection which is accorded by the First Amendment to specific categories of speech, including racist or hate speech but also to justify uh, the priority which is sometimes given, or which is given by some, to these particular fundamental rights over other fundamental rights. So the priority which is sometimes given to the First Amendment over other amendments. And this democratic justification of free speech uh, is probably the most influential doctrinal and philosophical conception which, is, which informs uh, the interpretation of the Supreme Court's case law. The understanding of free expression as a, a democratic principle is also, of course, an old idea in Europe, an old philosophical and legal idea. And it has been affirmed not only uh, by the European Court of Human Rights, but also in the basic text and philosophical traditions of many European democracies. Uh, freedom of expression has a constitutive importance for the democratic process, in the words of the German Federal Constitutional Court, it is even seen as a primary right to be enjoyed by the citizen in a democratic order, in the words of the House of Lords Judicial Committee. But once again, the legal implications of such statements, the legal implications of this relation between free expression and democracy are less clear cut in Europe than in the United States. There's no, of course, of course there's no equivalent, there's no European equivalent to the extensive protection afforded by the First Amendment to certain categories of speech, and there's no European equivalent to the priority which is sometimes affirmed or assigned to the First Amendment. And this has led some commentators to suggest that in fact in Europe uh, those statements are merely rhetorical. So the essential or primary nature of freedom of expression is essentially symbolic in nature. It would be devoid of any real legal significance. So, we believe that such a, a conclusion would be uh, too hasty. Rather, uh, the point is that European um, regulation of democratic speech arises from a very different understanding of freedom of expression and a very different understanding of democracy that is now standard in US constitutional law. That's the first point. A second point, even more important, is that in Europe, there's a plurality of national tradition uh, um, uh, a plurality of um, legal conceptions of the relationship between free expression 
and democracy, and of course, a diversity of legal frameworks. And this is undoubtedly a challenge for any attempt to, uh, to find a unified, coherent conception, which would be similar to, to the kind of a coherent uh, uh, conception that uh, commentators are, are looking for when analyzing US constitutional law. However, uh, uh, within this priority of approaches, there's also some common ground and some similarities uh, for historical reasons, of course, and also because of the influence of the European Court of Human Rights on national communication law in, in the past, uh, in the recent decades. So we believe that the common feature of a European approach or a family of European approaches to freedom of expression as a democratic right may still emerge from a, a comparative look at European law and scholarship. And, and this explains the, the kind of uh, method we have uh, chosen for the book. So to, to identify what is uh, or what should be a, a democratic right to free expression, we intend to combine the resource of comparative law on the one hand and legal philosophy on the other. So first, uh, most chapters will contribute to this general inquiry by focusing on a specific issue through a comparative study of several different European legal orders. They will focus on countries where uh, democratic interpretation of free speech have been explicitly theorized uh, or have produced um, uh, significant regulation or, or, or laws. And uh, in places on context um, where this general idea has found some kind of uh, institutional uh, translation since the post war period. They will focus also on European law, in particular, of course, the European Court of Human Rights, which has developed a much more considerable case law on the subject than the, the Court of Justice of, of the European Union. But the book is not a book about the European Court of Human Rights. It, the, the, our ambition is really to draw a comparison between these various European traditions for which the European Court of Human Rights has become something of a partially common denominator. Second, uh, regarding legal philosophy or legal theory, the book's overall structure does not follow um, a division that would be imposed by canonical distinctions between branches of law uh, or between national traditions. It's rather built around the main, or what appears to us to be, what appear to us to be the main theoretical questions which are raised when you adopt a democratic understanding of freedom of expression. Uh, and uh, philosophical uh, theories uh, of this, analyzing this relationship. So for instance, some theories of the marketplace of ideas in North America, or uh, theories of the public sphere in Europe. Uh, so those philosophical theories suggest certain theoretical implications, which may or may not be realized uh, in practice, and which should or should not be realized in practice. So the general idea is to confront existing theoretical discourses on free expression and its democratic function or its democratic role with, the act, with its actual treatment by legal text and, and, and by courts. So five main questions can be identified. Uh, first, how do European legal orders understand the relation between freedom of expression and democracy? How have they built historically these interpretations? Second, what is the content or what are the components of a democratic right to freedom of expression? Third, how does it apply to different kinds of speeches, different kinds of agents or different kinds of forums? So how does it translate into the very differentiated structure of public debate? Fourth, how can uh, this democratic right to free expression meet the normative demands of public debate. How the regulation of free speech can contribute or impede uh, principles or objectives such as equal access or equal participation, access to information, or pluralism in particular. Sorry for the noise. Finally, a fifth. How is it and how can it be protected against both public powers and private powers? So those five general questions uh, uh, give the structure of the five parts of the book. 
So I'm, I'm going to just go briefly over the table of contents uh, without entering into the details, um, because it's also the program of the conference, although in a different order because of uh, scheduling constraints and, and time zones complications. Um, so uh, 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 our introduction with Pierre and Andrew will present the subject of the book, of course, and the, the theoretical questions that guide it and the, the comparative methodology. And there's, there'll be a second introductive chapter, which I'll write, which will um, highlight the main philosophical question raised by the idea of freedom of expression as a democratic right from the point of view uh, of uh, political and legal philosophy. And then we'll have these, uh, each part dealing with each of the five questions I mentioned. So part one is meant to offer a historical and conceptual insight into the main European traditions uh, of legal thought that have explicitly addressed the relation between free expression and democracy uh, since the Second World War. Uh, and of course, different views and, and different challenges to the idea of a, a democratic right to, to free speech uh, will, be consider, uh, will be successively considered uh, in the history of the European Court of Human Rights uh, in the François Tulkin's uh, chapter. Uh, of civil law countries, and notably the German approach in Dieter Grimm's uh, chapter, of common law country, uh, and especially in the UK, in Eric Barron's chapter, of Northern European countries, including, but not exclusively, uh, Sweden, in uh, Eva Maria Swenson's piece, and finally, of the post-communist countries uh, of Eastern Europe after 1989, uh, in Alexandra Glesinska grabias chapter. And there will be a, a final comment for this section by Mark Tushnet. The idea is for each section to have a concluding essay by a scholar commenting on the European approach as it is described in the part of the book, uh, but uh, a scholar coming from a non-European or non-strictly European perspective. So this is the first uh, part of the book, but it will be the last panel of the conference. So it will be tomorrow. And unfortunately, Francoise Tulkins will be absent. So. Uh, the conference will end around 6 p.m. and at uh, 6.30. The second part of the book uh, deals with uh, different dimensions, or if one, or maybe components of freedom of expression understood as a democratic right. And it will consider the content of this right from the point of view uh, of the general citizen, the general right to free expression in Johannes Mazing's uh, chapter, from the point of view of speakers specifically, in uh, Oreste Policino and Marco Bassini's chapter, from the point of view of audience members or members of the public in Ellen Fenwick's chapter, and finally, uh, from the point of view of collective uh, actors uh, in Gwenael Calves' uh, final chapter, and with a final comment uh, by Adrian Storr. Um, the panel uh, for this part will be tomorrow morning at 10.30 uh, uh, Paris time or Lyon time, uh, uh, Gwenelle uh, Calves uh, won't be able to, to participate, but uh, we'll have Ellen Fenwick, uh, Oreste Policino, and Barco Massini, as well as Adrien. Part three of the book is devoted to um, the structure of public debate, um, which can be uh, analyzed or defined by um, identifying the different kinds of forums uh, in Johannes Mazing's other chapter, the different kind of discourses in Patrick Waxman's chapter, or the different kind of agents uh, of public debate in Orsholaya Salat Shalat's uh, chapter. So the different kind of forums, discourses, and agents to which the various protections and obligations associated with free expression uh, apply in a differentiated way, once again. And the, co the final comment for this session uh, will be by Ellen Norton. This will be the last session um, today at the end of the afternoon. Uh, uh, Orshulaya could not make it, uh, so we will also end around 6 p.m. Uh, today and not 6.30 as initially planned. Part four of the book examines uh, what could be called the standards of public debate, uh, the normative requirements that come with the idea of a democratic debate and not just any kind of public communication relating in particular to equality of access and participation in Tarlac McGonagall's chapter, uh, to access to information and protection against misinformation uh, uh, in Jack Robotum's uh, chapter, and to pluralism and diversity of opinion in Andrew Kenyon's chapter. Uh, and the final comment will be made by Marta Mino. 
uh, this uh, panel uh, will be the first one in the afternoon tomorrow. Finally, part five of the book, uh, but it will be the first panel of the conference starting in a few minutes, uh, is about the safeguards to public debate, or uh, to put it in, uh, uh, in another way, uh, the protections uh, uh, needed for freedom of expression as a democratic right. Uh, it deals both with uh, modes of legal reasoning uh, used to protect or to apply freedom of expression, uh, such as the question of scope or the scope test in Christoph Bezemek's uh, contribution, uh, or the test of proportionality in uh, George Letza's chapter. And also, finally, uh, it will deal with uh, the, the legal status of private powers and the kind of protection um, against uh, private powers or private threats to freedom of expression. Uh, 